Listen up. There's no more excuses. We're empowering those who want the hustle by exposing the status quo. The days of ordinary are over. It's time to crush mediocrity and start discovering your greatest potential. Welcome to the Hustle Nation. 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 Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, we've got Billy Samoa Salibi in the house today. That's a little bit of a mouthful, but our friend Billy is the co-founder and CEO of Podify. Billy, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invite and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you here. Billy, you're certainly connected with us on LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of our former guests you're connected with and some of our future guests you're connected with. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it's, uh, f- gosh, I mean, where to begin? I mean, I'll, I'll give you the abbreviated version. I started in the film business. I'm from LA, so in college, I was first a business major and then quickly realized that I did not like my econ class. So I switched majors, became a film major. And as any good film major will do, you figure out what you do out of college. I was like, okay, I better make a movie. So that's what I did. I made a movie and I worked on sets before that. So I got to learn the ropes. I was a PA and did a whole bunch of interesting film jobs. And then I made my own movie, which ultimately was picked up and released, got distribution. It's on Netflix and Amazon, you name it. It was an amazing experience, but it did not necessarily give me the financial reward that I needed to start a family. So as, as you might imagine, I started thinking, okay, what do I do next for the chapter where I'm going to build a family and start to become, you know, a bit more self-sustained. And so I got into the renewable space. This was 2010. At the time, it was very new. Uh, there was a lot of momentum building and I instantly had success. I did really well. You know, I know that the, the theme of this show is, is all about hustle and what it means from a behavior standpoint. I had a lot of my early success because of the roles that I had before, including being an athlete and working in restaurants. So sales came naturally to me because I just, I cared about the experience other people had and that really catapulted my career. I quickly got promoted to be a manager broke the record both as an individual contributor and then as a manager at the company I was with. They're like, okay, you need to just train everybody. So I trained all the salespeople. And then eventually I was the head of sales as as VP of sales. I got recruited to go work for the biggest solar company, which was Solar City. And if you know the backstory there, Solar City was acquired by Tesla. I I led leadership development for Solar City, sales training for Solar City. And then when Tesla acquired Solar City, I had the opportunity to build the onboarding program for Tesla, which was an amazing journey because, you know, who everybody knows the, this Tesla story and it's a disruptive company. And so I really relished that opportunity ended up being in charge of all of sales and product training globally for Tesla before I said, okay, I'm going to get off my corporate surfboard because I I did always have that entrepreneurial spirit, even though as a kid, as a 19, 18 year old, I, didn't like my econ class, I still have that desire to build something myself, which started as a podcast, my own podcast, Inside Out, and then evolved into my business, which is Podify. So I built a team to help me produce my own show. And then by virtue of doing that, I realized other people need help. So I built a, a team that could help other people. And that was the genesis for my now company, Podify, where we, we helped to build the platform for thought leaders to share their message, whether it be a podcast, a YouTube channel, or social media, or all of the above. We do all the legwork on the back end so they could focus on what they do best, which is their thought leadership. Billy, so many questions, so many questions from that. Um, First of all, I think of Hollywood and I think of the movie business. Who wouldn't want to be, especially growing up, who wouldn't want to be in that industry? But when you mentioned a couple things, uh, what, what didn't really fill your cup and didn't really pay your bills, how, how could one want to not be in that business? What, is it really <laughs> to the point to where you can't make that much money? Because it, it looks like you've produced several movies. Yeah. Well, I think, that, you know, it's, there's so many layers to the industry. Conventional wisdom is that it, it, 
if you want to make significant money, you need to be one of the executives who's calling the shots in development or really being at an elite level, which very few people can get to that. So then you look at, okay, from a standpoint of just surviving, being an actor is extremely difficult, probably the most difficult. So let's take that out of the equation. And I didn't have a desire to do that. But then there's so many other jobs you can have. You could be on the post-production side. You could be on the production side. You could be on the creative side. And so do you work for a studio and move up the ranks? Are you independent and then try to get recognized and then get hired by the studios? In today's age, it's, I mean, it's changed a lot since the time I graduated. There's so much content being made. It really, it comes yeah. down to what do you want to do? What do you want to do with your day? And so while there is money in the space, it, you know, finding your own little section that you're going to carve out, to me, it comes back to what are you good at? What do you love doing? And where are you most needed that will pay you the money that you need to survive? And what I realized for me, is like, I didn't have a desire to do production and to be married mm -hmm. to a set for 14 hours a day you know, or 10 hours a day or whatever it may be, that didn't appeal to me for the long term, short term, sure, but long term, it didn't. So that's why I sort of pivoted. And I'm still interested in doing film stuff. That's part of the reason I got into the podcast space is now I'm back in the creative space, just a different medium. And guess what? I'm starting to do some more visual medium things that allow me to scratch that itch as well. So I'm curious in your transition when you went from kind of the theater uh, production side, film side to renewables. Mm -hmm. so it had to have been to a point in time where, you know, we, we all have like a, an identity of who we are of mm. ourselves. Right. And making that shift. I mean, it, sem it seems like you kind of came full circle and now you're kind of coming back, back to yeah. it to some extent, but you know, I'm curious just from a mindset perspective, was it just, I gotta, I gotta do something else because this isn't, this isn't frankly, getting me where I need to be um, and then ch kind of changing your identity or that way. But I guess just what was your mindset in that yeah. shift? Because I think a lot of times as people are making life shifts like that, there, there's a concern they're going to lose their identity and their passion. And, mm -hmm. and so they, they candidly, they, they stay, I don't yeah. want to say miserable because I'm not saying you were miserable in that time, but like not fully fulfilled because they're afraid of making that pivot. Great question. I actually haven't reflected it on it in the way in which you've asked it. So thank you for doing that. It just it gives me a chance to kind of think back to that moment. It, it kind of happened by accident. So my brother was working for this solar company. He needed help to produce a video. And he knew I was the video guy, film guy. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. And then he said, hey, I was like, tell me a little bit more about what you do. And he's like, well, we put solar on people's roof for no out-of-pocket cost. And they get solar power and they just pay for the electricity the solar panel produces over a 20 year period. And it's less cost than what they're paying their utility. I'm like, that's kind of a no brainer. He's like, yeah. So then I was like, okay, let me look more into this. And it so happened. They needed more people. I got hmm. a, what was an independent contractor role. So it was like low commitment. You know, I could do it as much as I wanted. Yeah. But then when I started seeing success, that's when I was like, okay, like when you see the success in something, it pulls, A, it pulls you in, but B, it, it gives you the, the feeling and the excitement to do more of it. And I think it, it, this could apply to anything that you do in life is when you get that early win, it propels you. It gives you the motor that you need to do more of it. And so it wasn't as much of a conscious decision like, hey, I'm making a hard pivot to not be the film guy and instead I'm going to be the renewable guy. It just, it happened more organically. And, and I, yeah. you know, I'll just be super candid. Seven years of making a movie. I was burnt out. Like I did not want to do another seven year movie because it yeah. just, to me, it was like so much of my heart and soul and passion went into it that I, I just didn't have any more at that point. Today I do, but like you were talking 15 yeah. years later. So, yeah, you know. And so then what, what about the next phase going from being in that space to, you know, being in the corporate space to then jumping back on your own? Because obviously, you, I mean, you had insane success, you know, being at, being at Tesla, right? And being in an organization that 
so many people aspire to. It would have been really easy for you to write off your career very successfully, by the way, <laughs> uh, and, and not, and not, you know, not take the risk, not take the leap. You know, what, what really drove that in your head? Yeah. You know, I had always in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm not going to do this forever. But at the same time, it's like, I don't want to really leave this job. It's, it's got all the comforts that one would want in life, not only a steady paycheck and obviously all the things that you get with a corporate job, like the benefits and healthcare and all these things that, you know, we as adults need to me, like I loved all those things and the travel, although sometimes a bit too much, it was also kind of exciting. And I had a fun role. Like I got to, I got to teach people how to teach other people and be up in front of the room or do the things that I enjoy doing, which is sharing knowledge, helping people excel in their role. And I was one layer removed from Elon. I mean, my boss reported to Elon. So it was, it was fun. It was cool. So you're right. Like there was definitely some times where I didn't know when or how I would get off the wave, right? Get off that corporate yeah. wave. Yeah. And you know, I had been promoted probably five months before uh, I left. And the reason I left, I, I got a call from my boss who said, I just been promoted to like a global role overseeing, you know, APAC and Europe and North America. Yeah. And Elon likes a flat organization. So he's like, he, she had a call with him and he's, Basically, Elon fired me is, is the simplest way to think of it. I mean, I, I like to joke and, and say that, but could I have stayed at Tesla in a different role? Yes, because, you know, I've been promoted over and over and over again, could have joined the sales org, but did I really want to keep doing what I was doing? So I said, let me use this as an opportunity at huge severance. I wish I'd kept all my stock. I mean, if I fell asleep when I left... I would uh, probably have a higher net worth than I do right now. But you know, these are all learning opportunities. This is before the stock <laughs> split multiple times. And so you, you, you live life and you learn. But it never, ever was something that I felt called to do, which was stay in corporate. Because yeah. you, you work yeah. at Tesla. I mean, the amount of people knocking at my door, I could have landed a job at Apple, at Disney, at you name it, like anywhere. But to me, yeah. for, for me at that time, it's like, what's the next chapter of my story. And it didn't involve working for a company that wasn't my own. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Let's, let's hone in on Tesla for a moment. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, you obviously got to meet Elon, talk to him. What's he like as a leader yeah. and what was one of your biggest takeaways as, as an employee or as a leader within the Tesla mm -hmm. organization? It's so many. So being that I had a, a the director level role. There was only about 200 people out of a 60,000 person organization that got to be on some of the calls with Elon. When we did delivery at the end of the quarter, I would be at the delivery hub and, you know, Elon would either be on a call or in some cases his security, this is one story, security detail for Elon, it, it, man, what a job they have. Because there's, if he's going somewhere, they may go to location A and location B so that they don't televise where he's going. So he can go to either place. That's how well thought out his day is. I mean, they need to choreograph everything. But to answer your question, Elon's not perfect. Everybody knows that. He's got a ton of flaws. But clearly, you cannot argue what he's been able to accomplish. And so to me, the greatest skill set that he has is the ability to ask questions that will solve the most challenging problems. Listening to him very quickly understand what's going on at a, at a granular level to, to the point where it could be something as mundane as where do we park the cars? Like we need to have a place to park the cars. And somebody gave him an objection. Oh, we're all out of parking lots in Los Angeles. No more parking lots. And to him, that's limited mindset. Like yeah. you don't need a parking lot to park a car. You could park a car on a lot of, that's just a, you know, a store or a baseball field or soccer field. It just never, ever was something that he would use as a, as a, as a limiting factor. That person ended up losing their job, by the way. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So the thing that I always think about is like, 
How do you ask the questions to get to the root of the problem? That's what you want to get to. And so you got to peel back the onion. So that's one big thing. The other big thing with Elon, and some people know this who study him, is he does not reason by analogy. And what I mean by that, he's solving problems and coming up with products using first principles thinking. And the idea there is instead of saying there's all the vehicles that have existed before Tesla, how do we make them just a little bit better? No, he says, what if we were building a car and cars never existed? Thinking about laws of nature, right? Physics and things that we know to be true. But aside from that, everything else is, is off the table. Like you could do anything. So why do his vehicles feel different? It's because they're built from the ground up. You know, the, whether it be the expansive windshield or being able to play a video game or making the car basically like a, a, a transportable iPhone. He's not thinking of anything that's going to limit him. And so first principles thinking is to me the greatest lesson that I learned there because we all go through life just thinking about how do we make things just a little bit better than what existed? And that throws that approach out the window. Build from the ground up and don't let anything determine what you build based on what's happened before you. I feel like in the last couple of years, he's become more misunderstood. Like people just don't understand the, the brain and the process of Elon Musk. And I think I could probably navigate to why, but I'm curious if, uh, you know, by just osmosis, you've been able to pick up on some of that. I agree with you, man. It's, it's, it's interesting to watch, you know, it's, it's kind of sad that, his, you know, his, people love him, but there's, there, he's got a lot of detractors, a lot of haters. You know, he speaks his mind very quickly. And sometimes I think he probably doesn't think about the aftermath. I don't think he cares necessarily in most cases. And so with that, you're going to get some casualties, some collateral damage that happens. Um, you know, he's thinking hundreds of years into the future. Very few people do that. So when he's thinking as he does, it's not, he doesn't care about a singular person. He cares about humanity and he doesn't care about, you know, necessarily offending one or maybe even a group of people and to, you know, at his own expense, right? Like that's, that's what you see, especially in the news cycle today, you know, is he anti-Semitic or is he this or is he that? I actually don't think he is. I think he is going to speak off the cuff and probably without caring, you know, he's not going to soften it. He's not, he's not part of the, you know, I hate to use this term, but like the woke, you know, the, like he's, yeah. that's like, doesn't even cross his mind. He's thinking very, like an engineer would think. And, and without, yeah. um, he's not, he's not going to soften it for the, the individual person. Now, all that to be said, everything he's doing is to make, man an interplanetary planetary species and to advance ourselves individually whether it be Neuralink or the boring company or spacex or tesla all of these things combined are for the good of humanity so i think that's the lens he's looking through so to answer your question i think you know his stock personal stock may have fallen because of this some of the remarks he's made but i think it's because he's not looking at how one or two of the things he says is affecting individuals that doesn't register to him. Yeah. I think it's interesting to your point of the, the studying of him. I mean, I th it, it's interesting his, his mindset on things and how, and his ability to communicate complex things very simply. Right. Mm. Uh, I know one of the, uh, quotes that he had, which actually we, we talk about uh, with our leadership team a lot is, you know, one of the greatest problems that a, uh, an incredible engineer has is automating things that should never have been done to begin with. <laughs> so true, right? <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it, it's funny and it's clear, but it, it, it's one of those things where once you, once you hear it, mm. it allows you to think, well, of course, but how, to your point, how much of business and even our lives are lived through an incremental lens of just how do we get a little bit different? How do we get a little bit better? How do we get a little bit better versus 
That's right. Really taking a step back to your point, that first principle, thinking of what are we even trying to accomplish here? Yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, if you, it's like, I don't know if uh, this should be shared, but I'll share it anyway. You know, he would say Salesforce is like a virus, Salesforce the CRM. And, and I mean, that's just the way he thought of it. And so to your point, right? Like in his mind, wh why do we need this? Like what's, what's the purpose? And, but we all know Salesforce is a dominant player because a of the value it provides, but B because they make themselves so integral to the process that it's very difficult to remove. And mm -hmm. so for him, and I think for a lot of leaders, we look at things and we do build processes and systems and tools to make ourselves more efficient. And he's, as an engineer, always going to say, well, is this really needed? And if so, why or why not? And if it's not, how do we remove it? And I think where he's challenged is sometimes things can't be removed. And he, and he, you know, he's not a big sales guy. Like he thinks the product should yeah. sell itself in his words. Yeah. And I think he actually said this. I want it to be so easy to buy a Tesla that you could literally fall asleep on your keyboard and order one. And yeah. so how do you create a frictionless buying experience? So yeah. much so that it, like, it makes it so user-friendly, so easy and so seamless that it, it just becomes effortless. And, and so for me, like in my role, like you could see why he doesn't value a guy who's like a global head. It's like, why do we need him if we have lieutenants? You know, if we have somebody in APAC, somebody in EMEA, somebody in North America, well, why do we need this guy? You yeah. know what I'm saying? And in, in, yeah. in truth, like you, you say, you know, I, I know Elon. I didn't, I didn't know Elon. I mean, like, did I shake his hand? And did I get to experience him? And did I get to listen to him? Yeah, but he's even being one layer removed. He's, you know, Tesla's one of many responsibilities that he has. And then within that, he's got his core leaders and, and he's got those same things that, that SpaceX, he's got those same things that the other companies that he works at. So I'm, you know, still far enough removed that I'm not super close to the sun, uh, which probably was a good thing. Although I did still get burned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's talk about the, the next kind of layer in the onion, which is podcasting and what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. You are currently the, the co-founder and CEO of Podify. Talk a lot of, uh, a little bit about this industry of podcasting. I, I got yeah. in this space a long, long, long time ago before it became ultra saturated. And it is amazing to see how many people are, are not only producing podcasts, but also the amount of people consuming podcasts. Yeah. And I mean, I, I foresee a day in the future where it becomes more popular than FM radio. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's radio on demand. And, and what, what other yeah. way can you put it? And beautiful that we have this opportunity to literally create libraries, volumes of content on specific subjects. And, and the nuance and, and the thing that I love about this medium is, is so three things that I think of intimacy. So it's like I'm talking, I'm almost whispering in your ear. Like I'm, yeah. that's the kind of connection you can have and the vibration of the human voice is so powerful that if we allow ourselves to get immersed in any medium that is an audio based platform, you have the ability to create tons of layers to this intimate, intimate experience uh, experience. So that's one, you have intimacy and then two, you have frequency. So not only do you got that intimacy once, but you have it over and over and over again, your biweekly show, weekly show, monthly show, if you got that frequent experience to get this listen, you know, have the, the listeners grow to gain some lo loyalty and attachment to you. And then you have duration, like, because it's a, a platform that lends itself to long form content. Very few forms of content are as long. The only one I could think of is an audio book, which is similar in nature. So you have a, you know, intimate medium that's delivered frequently and when it's delivered, it's delivered at a long duration. And so what that does is it creates a very, very high likelihood that you could get to know someone on a much deeper level than you otherwise would be able to. And you, and you couple all of those things with this idea that you're able to take, give it any topic, and you're able to have a conversation about it that gets past the surface level. Because it's like, who wants surface level anyway? 
Like you want to get into the, to the nitty gritty, get past that. And so that's why I think it's so amazing. And, you know, on the saturation piece, like true, there are so many people doing podcasts, but if you look at the real numbers comparatively, let's call it 4 million, 5 million podcasts exist. Only about four to 500,000 produced an episode in the last 30 days. Those are the latest numbers I got. So it's still a fraction of what there is compared to say a blog. So I think there's 31 million active blogs or a YouTube channel that has over 10,000 subscribers. I forget the number, like 3 million. I could be off on the numbers. They might not be exact, but the point being is there's a, a lot of content exists throughout all the different mediums. And then social, you add a whole nother layer. The cool thing about a podcast is it's pillar content, right? It's one form is a YouTube video. Another form is an audio that's distributed through an RSS feed. But then all the omni-channel possibilities that you have to slice and dice and cut that up into micro content. To me, the line is blurring between what a podcast is and what a podcast can create. And so... Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about it because from a thought leader standpoint, and that's our wheelhouse is we help thought leaders develop their platform and build their platform and, and get distribution for their platform. It, it's, it's, you, you have so many different ways you can maximize that and build from it that it makes it kind of a no brainer. Like, why would you not do this? Yeah. So Billy, let's take an a, an example uh, for a, this is called a medium sized business, and there there are plenty of businesses out there that have struggled with their digital marketing, specifically social media. And that the question that comes up a lot, and this is someone who comes from a marketing background, is you know we don't know what to post about, we don't know what to talk about. So let's pretend we're a an insurance company because I happen to know someone who runs an insurance company. <laughs> um, how would you? pitch that or position that it's like, this is why you need a podcast. Yeah. And this is how it's going to benefit your company. Yeah. And there's so many applications from a B2B or B2C space, any, any brand looking to get more exposure should look at a podcast specifically for the reason that take some of the key executives. It could be the CEO, could be the head of marketing, could be the head of sales, could be another person that is a key person of influence within the organization and giving them this type of platform that allow them to build a stronger connection to their core audience is going to pay huge dividends. So the first thing I look at is what are they doing currently? And most of the time they do what I call check the box content. So yes, did they do a short video? Did they do some sort of graphic? Yeah, they did it, but is it connecting? Is it shareable? So what I always look for is what's going to be a novel, and when I say novel, a new way to share a concept that may already exist. It could be a new framework, could be a new packaging, or better yet, it takes conventional wisdom and it turns it on its head. So people want new. They don't want the same recycled thing over and over again. They want new information that's going to help them be better in a certain area of their life. And so what I always suggest is how can we package the thought leadership in a way that's going to be surprising, interesting, funny, emotional, something that's going to make people have a cognitive burden when they see it, that they actually feel compelled to share it with other people. And that's what you want to create shareable content. So 30 to 60 seconds of an idea People say, oh, I got to share this so that other people, so that they get some E, recognition for sharing it. B, they can reduce the cognitive burden that they were feeling because they have this information. They like almost feel a responsibility or a duty to share it. So you want to create that. Um, moving backwards from there, it's where are they seen today and where should they be seen as a player in their space? And so any company that wants to be a player in their space and they want to be known and recognized should have an omni-channel output, right? So maybe it's TikTok, maybe it's YouTube shorts, maybe it's Instagram reels, maybe it's their newsletter, or maybe it's all of the above. And, you know, there's obviously things that come into play. So it's like, okay, where do you start? Well, you start where your customers are most likely to be. And so you look and say, okay, who is my avatar? 
who's my my client profile that I'm seeking. And then from there, like be present where those people are. Maybe it's an older demographic, so you're gonna over-index on Facebook. Maybe it's a younger demographic, so you over-index on TikTok. Wherever that may be, create content that's delivered there on a volume basis. And what I mean by that is a lot of people think they can put out a video a week and they're gonna hit the, the numbers. That's very <laughs> unlikely. And so the way yeah. you get the traction is by consistently showing up over time by putting out volumes of content. It's a, you got to be prolific. You got to put out enough. And what ends up happening is something is going to strike a chord and is going to get traction. That way you get that viral video. You're not seeking virality by itself, but it will happen if you put out enough content. So those are just a few thoughts. You know, one of the things you're, you're hitting on, which I think is important in podcasting. I think it's important in so many different things, but it's that sh that uh, level of commitment, that level of time, energy, and effort in any strategy mm. that you're you're applying to, right? Like you talk about podcasting. Chris and I talked about this when we actually kicked off this podcast. Was everybody was asking us like, well, what is your goal, and you know, how many listeners and subscribers and all that sort of stuff? And we just said, you know, actually in this phase one for us, we want to get to 50 episodes because the reality is, is most people quit before they go to 50 episodes mm -hmm. because they're, they want to overthink a thousand different things and iterate and, and then they never move. And it's yeah. like, you know what, we're just going to move. We're just going to yeah. start. Let's just, you know, let's just go. And I, and I think, you know, your tier point, then using that content at, at a pace that, you know, is, is almost 10 X what most people anticipate, right? To your point, I would argue there's probably some people that think, man, if I could do one a week, that would be, you know, one, <laughs> one video a week, that would be incredible. Yeah. Well, anybody in the, you know, if you asked 10 people that actually knew what they were talking about, they'd say, yeah, that's not even close. Yeah. <laughs> you're, not, you're not even in the same category, but I think that's really, that's an interesting approach. I think the other thing that I, I picked up from uh, listening to you that I think is interesting in this world of five second sound bites. Why is it that so many people are gravitating towards long form mm. in podcasting? And yeah. in, in my head, I believe it is because the five second sound bites don't give you real actionable change and they don't build real relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's world where so many people feel disconnected and alone, and that I think the podcasting to me seems to be a thing that's filling a lot of those, a lot of those gaps for people where yeah. They're actually getting real relationships, real knowledge of people getting beyond that, that five second soundbite. Yeah. You, you bring up a good point. I th I'll, a few thoughts. So first and foremost, the long form and the, the short form, they're not mutually exclusive. They, they're both helpful. One gets you the tentacles out there from a distribution standpoint. A podcast inherently is not a, a distribution platform as much as it is a loyalty platform. And what I mean by that is, Podcast, you, you put a podcast out, like if you don't do the marketing, it's a lot like a book. Like you put a book out, it's not going to get traction unless you go do radio interviews, you go on podcasts, you, you, you just talk, it, you do speaking events, you do book signings, you do all these things to kind of like create a little bit of kindling for the fire. And then enough people see it that they'll tell their friends about it. It's a good book. It'll start to grow virally, but you got to stoke the flames. By, by doing things, right? Like putting yourself out there. Podcast is much the same way. You know, are you doing YouTube shorts? Are you doing Instagram reels? Are you doing TikTok? Are you doing the things necessary to get out there? And within that, do you have a strategy for the pieces of content you're putting out so it's not check the box? So a small example, like the first frame of your video is kind of like a, a thumbnail on YouTube. And so the, the small little nuance a lot of people don't think about it. Are you making it as short as it possibly can be? Every second of a short matters. So Jenny Hoyos, she's a, a YouTuber, does shorts. If you watch an episode of Jay Klaus's podcast called Creator Science, they dissect every frame of a short, like to the painstaking detail. And the point th that I got is like, you got to be, absolutely sure that every second of that short counts. So you got to remove stuff. 
you got to make sure that it's synthesized to the only the best parts. And so with, with a podcast interview, you know, you're going to have somebody talking, but what's the visual, what's the motion graphic, what's the music creating the mood, what's the content that you're picking out? How are you building it up? What's the hook? Like all, and how are you delivering on that hook? And so all these little nuances matter for short form content. As far as going to your question, like the long form, to me, like the beauty of long form is that you do get much more depth into the content and a lot more nuance. And so why, why would I watch, for example, going back to Jay Klaus, who, who I'm a huge fan of, why do I watch his entire interview with Jenny Hoyos? It's because I'm getting way more understanding than I would in a 30 second version of that. So I could get introduced to the content through the 30 second short form, but then I go watch and subscribe to Jay's long form so that I could actually start to really understand the, 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 the nuance and the detail behind it. So I could take action. People want roadmaps. They want plans and blueprints. The plans and blueprints only really come to life in that longer form content. I just understand that that exists by finding it through the short form content. Yeah. And one other thing I'll say, just, just one other thing I'll say is going back to your point on the 50 episodes, don't assume that your version one should be as good as your version 10 as a recovering (laughs) perfectionist. The best advice I, I was ever given was think in versions. Think in ways that you can allow yourself to let go of version one, which is an MVP, so that you can get feedback on it and, and make it better so you have a improved version two. If you're releasing your version 10 as your version one, you've released too late. Whether it be a podcast, YouTube, social, whatever it may be, let go. and embrace the suckiness because it's going to happen for the first part. Embrace it. So I'm going to ask another question about that. For those that are jumping into podcasting or considering it, how do you continually make it better? Because I get it as a communicator, the host is inevitably going to improve by asking better questions, by being more prepared, being more engaged. But how do you get the show to be more listenable, more desirable, for the people out there. Uh, great. I love this question. And yes, you're right. Reps by themselves will make you better. Like, why did I become a better, like I had years of public speaking and communication under my belt before leaving Tesla. And even before I got to Tesla, I'd been on stage for you know a lot of my early, you know, in my twenties, I was speaking on stage at events from some of the companies that I worked for and some of the things that I did even in my early 20s I was I was speaking but going to clubhouse as a 40 something year old and being on a microphone for hours on end got me better at speaking because of the reps but let's set that aside cuz we all know that to be true the number one way I think people get better is by becoming a student of others And the more you can learn from examples, this is a a little bit contradictory to the sort of first principles thinking, but it's different. And here's why it's different. What you're doing is you're looking at others in your space. So let's say you have a podcast on, call it affiliate marketing. I would become the biggest connoisseur of affiliate marketing podcasts on the planet so that you know every single one of them. You know their intro, you know their outro. You know the segments they do. You know the CTAs that they they have. You know the description. Everything about their show, you know as well as they do. And what you're going to pick up naturally is the nuance that makes them successful. So that if you want to be the best affiliate marketing podcast, you know the tapestry of what's already out there. Because it, it matters to understand and to be a student of the craft. And the more you know that, the better you get. And then the third part, so one is reps, two is become a student of what's already out there. And three is you got to embrace feedback like it's a gift. Embrace it so much so that when you get it, like you're not going to take all the feedback you get, you shouldn't because some of it's not good. 
but hopefully you have a people in your orbit. I always say have a board, personal board of directors. Have people in your life who will be able to tell you why your show isn't as good as you think. And, and those are your closest friends or, or business partners or whoever that you build relationships with who are comfortable being honest with you. And then be specific with what you want. Ask for specific feedback about the artwork or about the intro or about the segments or about a branding change you're thinking of making. And then involve those personal board of directors to the point where they can be your best um, advocate, but also your, 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 your critic who will give you the insights to make you better. So if you do those things, you do the reps, you understand what others are doing in your space and, and do the competitive analysis, and then you're unafraid to ask for feedback, and then you action that feedback based on what you think will deliver the best return on, on investment. I mean, I think that feedback can be used for anything. Having a personal board of directors is great, yeah. regardless of the industry that you're in. Yeah. If, if Think and Grow Rich, they, they have an imaginary board of uh, directors or, or league of advisors, or I forget what, exactly what they call it. And you could, you could pick people, you know, in your life to do that, but you could also have an imaginary one, right? Maybe, maybe it's Steve Jobs. Maybe it's Richard Branson. Maybe it's, you know, Elon Musk. What would Elon Musk do in this situation? And if you know these people well enough, you're probably able to, to channel some of their insights, their perspective, and the way in which they would approach certain things. Billy, I thought I heard uh, Santa back there, but it's your dog. I love that your dog made an appearance. On I know. The I was hearing him too. I was like, well, yeah, he's normally really quiet. So I'm like, I, I leave him in. Otherwise, he'll bark in the outside. But yeah, I was like, I heard, I heard that too. That's, That's why awesome. I muted afterwards. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Billy, we're running out of time, but before we let you go, tell us a little bit about Podify and what your company has going on. Yeah, I mean, thank you. And it's been a great conversation, guys. So Podify really was born because I needed help from my show. I needed help with editing. I needed help with video. I needed help with social. I just, you just don't have enough time. What I realized very early on is if I did the show to the degree that I wanted to, it's a full-time job. Like bottom line, full time job. And so what we do is we buy back time for people who typically don't have a lot of it. So speakers, authors, thought leaders, people who are running companies currently or have in the past run companies. And what they want to build is a platform to deliver their thought leadership. And we do that through our video production team, our audio production team, our designers, our copywriters, our social media experts. So we have these components of our of my business that help people do any or all of those things depending upon what they need the most help with. And, and the way in which we operate is it starts by first understanding. So we'll do a, a, a short strategy call where I learn what's the objective, what's your intention, where do you want to be a year or two years from now, what are the ways in which you're currently helping to get there, and what are the ways that you think you might need some support. And then from there, we build a, a program and deliverables that will achieve the results that you want. At the end of the day, you want a return on your investment. So if you're paying a company like ours, you know what are the specific metrics that we want to achieve. And then we always reverse engineer, reverse engineer our way to get to that intended outcome. Buying back your time is a hell of a positioning statement too, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. I mean, we all, it's one constant, right? We all have a finite amount of time. How we use it, how we choose to use it is really up to us. I mean, for me, the number one thing humans could get better at is prioritization. Most people suck at it. So if you get really good at prioritization and from there, once you know the priorities, it's how do I decide which priorities are meant for me and which priorities are better suited for others, then you find the sweet spot to allow you to accelerate your ability to achieve the things you want to achieve in life. Well said. That is a, that is a great one to drop here before we let you go. But before we do that, tell everybody where they can find you and where they can get connected with you. 
Yeah, so I'm super active on LinkedIn. Definitely, you can just type Billy Samoa, the island Samoa, you, 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 if you forget. Because my last name, Salibi, is a little, as you said, a little bit of a tongue twister. But just type in Billy Samoa, I'll pop up. And and, and send me a DM. Let me know that you heard about it here and, and would love to start the conversation there. Aside from that, you could go to Podify, P-O-D-I-F-Y dot com, and you could book a time on the site to to meet me. Um, and then, yeah, would love to to talk. Uh, thanks again. My, my podcast is Inside Out, so you can check it out there. And I have a new show that we just launched called Relearned, where we talk about some of the most important topics, things like burnout and perfectionism and resilience. And we say, well, what, can we, what can we relearn about these important topics? I have a co-host for that one. Love it. That's awesome. Billy, thank you much, so much for being on the show today. For all the listeners tuning in, we appreciate the ears. Until next time, peace. Thanks, guys. Thank you for being part of the Hustle Nation. If you're serious about raising the bar in your personal and professional life and willing to go all in on your success, head over to hustleleaders.com. Here you can get access to our Hustle Productivity ebook, attend our Hustle Masterclass, or challenge yourself to the 30 day Hustle Challenge. Pairing these tools and training with the Hustle Nation podcast will help you advance to a whole new level. Until next time, stay hungry and inspire those around you to hustle.